Okay, let's finish out colligative properties here. So um, the last colligative property that we're going to look at is osmosis, osmotic pressure. Uh, and then we'll quickly, I'll, I'll give you the equations that we use to sort of look at these things quantitatively. Um, and we'll look at solving some problems with them in class. Um, the equation part, the quantitative part for this is not... It, the the relationships are linear. They're nice, clean relationships, and it's it's a it's a very plugging plugging in numbers and solving type situation. So I'm not super worried about that. But the conceptual parts of this can get really tricky and heady. So that's that's why I spent so much time on this in the the videos. But uh, from a practical perspective, in terms of like what are we going to expect you to solve in a test? Yeah, we'll we'll do some of that in the in the class in our normal uh, nine a.m. lecture slot. Um. But okay, so we are with osmotic pressure. So um, if we start, we start by just considering a solution. Actually, let's let's just go with the classic way that it's explained. So if you take a tube like such, like so imagine you go to the glass shop, which we have at UT, we're one of the few universities not on the east coast that still has a permanent glass shop the glass blower in there is really friendly so if you ever want to stop in um, and say hi he'll probably be receptive to letting you at least look around uh, you know that assumes that you're actually on campus uh, and it's not a global pandemic but that, that probably won't be for the duration of our college experience uh, or your college experience but. all right anyway all right so hey i, I go to the glass blower i get in a blow a uh, glass tube like this and uh, here I put in a semi-permeable membrane. Yeah, what's a semi-permeable membrane? You know, in this experiment, it's like a little piece of plastic or something uh, that allows some things through and other things not through. And you're familiar with these, whether you realize it or not, because, you know, your skin is a semi-permeable membrane. Um, you know, you can love, rub like lotion and stuff in your skin. It goes across that barrier reasonably easy uh, and gets absorbed into the skin. But water, on the other hand, tends to kind of beat up on your skin. So cells essentially are surrounded by semi-permeable membranes that allow some things in and some things and keep some things out. Here, our semi-permeable membrane, it allows water to flow, but not salute so um yeah this membrane will allow water to flow through it uh, but it won't allow something like sodium or chloride or like a sugar molecule to get through it and so the way we start our experiment is we take both sides here and on one side we fill it up with oops pure water. On the other side, let's just say that we're using uh, sodium chloride solution, so a solution of table salt. Okay, um, so I'll put some, actually let's just use a different color. So for the pure water, uh, that's too much of a pain in the ass. I'll just use the, the classic little specs. <laughs> So these are dissolved solids inside of here uh, that I'm representing with specs. And on the other side, on the other side of this, we have just pure water. Um, and they're filled to the same exact heights inside of this glass tube. Man, I just keep, there we go. Uh, yeah, so what happens? So the first thing we want to think about, so most of, most of what we end up thinking about uh, in terms of what's going to happen. Um, what you want to draw on is your understanding or developing understanding of thermodynamics. So we want to think about the free energy of these two solutions or these two systems, I guess. So what I'm saying is we want to think about what is the free energy associated with pure water and what's the free energy associated with a solution. Um, so the free energy of a solution, I've probably said this in a different lecture, but the free energy of 
of a solution is always it's always lower than a pure solvent. So the delta G, or you want to call it delta G, but like G solution over here. And then over here we have G, I don't know, we'll call it pure. Um, G solution is lower than G pure. So uh, we have a potential energy difference that is separated by this semi-permeable barrier. And um, what will happen is because the free energies aren't equal, they will try to become equal. In fact, because of the way we set up the experience, experiment, they will actually be able to become equal. Um, so this is when we first set it up, if we let it sit for a long time so that we have exchange of water molecules can happen back and forth across this membrane, um, what we'll see is when we come back, so you set it up, you go to lunch, you come back, what do we see? We see that the side that had the sodium and chloride in it has increased in height, the, the water column there, and the pure water side, so pure water, and then aqueous sodium chloride, um, we see that this one is decreased. And so the height here has changed. And we can take that and use that uh, to quantify what's called the osmotic pressure. So, so I guess the, the first question is, why does this happen? Okay, so, so before we jump into the height, because uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you all the equations for the other ones too. Before we jump into like what we can do with that height change, why does the water flow over there? Um, so the free energy of the solution is lower, and by uh, the water moves towards the um, solution of sodium chloride, so to this side over here. And what that does is it increases the free energy of the solution. So as the solution becomes more dilute, its free energy increases. And that's sort of a, another way of saying what I'm saying up here, right? The closer something, as you dilute something, it's becoming more and more like a pure solvent. And so its free energy is increasing. So as pure water flows across this membrane, it starts to raise the free energy over here. Um, but eventually it stops. And it stops when it reaches equilibrium. And that is when G solution equals that of the pure water. So uh, the reason that it stops and it doesn't just keep going is because, I think at least, is because the way we set this up, um, there's gravity acting on the water column. And so the pressure on this side, I guess that's really a better way to say it. Because you now have more water inside of this water column, okay, the pressure has increased on the membrane. So, you know, you've got essentially just more mass over here. Uh, and so you're exerting more pressure on the semi-permeable membrane uh, on the left-hand side. That pressure is coming from um, gravity, right? There's a gravitational force acting on that water column that's increasing the pressure there. So not pressure in the sense of like, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's related, obviously, but it's not pressure in the sense that you think of when you think of like a, like a gas, right? We're talking about a, a column of liquid here, and the column is exerting... Uh, force on that semi impermeable membrane. And that's what we're talking about with pressure here. Whereas the pressure from this side on the other side over here has decreased. Okay, so they, uh, 
the sort of the gravitational potential of those two water columns has changed. Um, and that, combined with the change in the free energy of the solution from being diluted out by the pure water, uh, results in the free energy uh, being equal, the free energy of the solution and the free energy of the pure water being equal. Um, and so that's sort of all that's going on there. So ultimately, if we wanted to kind of put it succinctly, uh, is that the system starts out in a non-equilibrium state up here. And there's sort of this imbalance where the free energy is lower on this side than it is on this side, the side with the pure water. And so in order to equilibrate, the pure water side flows through that semi-permeable mem membrane and dilutes out the salt, which increases its free energy and allows you to get to this equilibrium state, which is where the free energy is equal on either side of the membrane. So as long as there, as long as there's a free energy difference uh, between those two, there's sort of this thermodynamic uh, impetus uh, for it to come to equilibrium. The place where you this really matters, this osmotic pressure thing, matters. It's kind of easier to think about in some ways, I guess, is in terms of cells. Um, so if you're going on to study medicine or something like that, uh, this this kind of stuff, I feel like is is probably pretty. You, you probably need to kind of have some grasp. I don't know. It depends on what kind of medicine you're doing. But um, yeah, if you have a cell and you have a, and you have a, let's see, like on the exterior of the cell, you've got, you know, some one molar sodium chloride, but the interior cell, um, I, I don't know what the actual concentration is, but like, you know, let, let's say that there's some concentration of sodium chloride here, um, the cell wall, which I'm drawing as this double layer barrier here, let me give it a color, acts as a semi-permeable membrane. And so if you take a cell and you put it into concentrated water, we can actually simplify this. Let's forget about having two solutions and set it up similar to our other experiment. Let's just say on the inside you have just pure water. Obviously in a cell you have other things, otherwise you wouldn't be alive. You have DNA dissolve proteins, but for the sake of this, just assume it's pure water. Um, what's going to happen there is that the water is going to flow out of the cell. Um, and it will just continue to flow out of the cell in order to try and get the free energy of the interior of the cell equal to the outside of the cell. In this experiment, you're not inside of this glass tube and you don't have this sort of gravitational pressure or whatever. So the water will just continue to flow out of the cell until it completely dehydrates. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, for a living system or whatever, it'll kill it. And so it, when, uh, if you've ever seen somebody dump, which is cruel, but uh, if you've ever seen somebody just dump salt on like a slug and the slug just starts like oozing all of this gross gel out, that's what's happening there. You're putting this really high concentration of salt on the exterior and you're, uh, so the, the free energy um, outside of the, the slug is much lower and so the water inside of the slug is like, okay, well, I'm going to move to the exterior um, of the cell. And, uh, and it just kind of dehydrates and kills the slug. Um, that's not as much of an issue with humans, like if you get in a, a pool of salt water or something, just because, uh, one, we're, you know, obviously we're much more sophisticated than slugs. But our, our body has, is just does a better job of, it's not, our, I guess our membranes are probably a lot more selective about how they, take things in and push things out and have a lot more regulatory mechanisms that stop that from happening. Um, but you, if you just like drink salt water from the ocean, for example, um, you know that you can't survive on that. Like if you're on a boat in the ocean and you get stranded, you can't drink the ocean water. And this is why, because osmotic pressure will ultimately dehydrate you. The salt water will draw water out of your system um, into your stomach and give you terrible diarrhea and you will dehydrate and die. Uh, so um, this kind of delicate balance of concentration across membranes is uh, like fundamentally important for, for life. It actually gets even more fundamental than just like survival. Um, concentration gradients across cells uh, are actually what drive uh, a lot of the biochemical processes that we have. So um, when you get into biochemistry, they'll, they'll talk about that. But ATP and all these kind of biomolecules and how we get energy 
um, and how all the energetic stores and stuff are controlled around cells all derives from this simple idea of having a, a potential energy difference between uh, on either side of a membrane. So osmotic pressure, you know, we're just going to brush up against it here. Um, but man, is it important uh, for life on our planet. Uh, and it's actually, it's hard to imagine. One of the reasons that people talk about water being so important for life um, and why we're always looking for water on other planets and not other solvents, because, you know, that's a thing. Like other planets might have like liquid ammonia or liquid, eh, liquid yeah, or liquid... Uh, like gasoline, like uh, one of the moons around Jupiter has gasoline. His whole atmosphere is just made of like weird hydrocarbons. Um, it's difficult to get a potential across. Uh, it's it's difficult to imagine life existing in those solvents because it's hard to set up a membrane that would have a potential across it in those types of environments. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why when we're looking for life on other planets, we're always searching for water. The other reason, obviously, is that on our planet, we know that no life exists without water. It's the one thing that you absolutely need for life. And we only have, you know, our current sample size for life is one. So uh, until we discover other life forms, we don't really know if that's true. But anyway, there's a lot uh, to unpack around this idea. Um, if you go on and take a formal thermodynamics course, there's even more to unpack in terms of the math and use a little bit of like uh, multivariate calculus and stuff. It's, 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 that course is pretty fun. Um, anyway, all right, so that's osmotic pressure. Uh, I invite you to think about what's going on there in more detail and kind of read up on it. Um, the more you read about stuff, the more interesting it tends to get. Uh, but yeah, for us, yeah, we're not, we're not gonna do anything insanely complicated with it. It, it is important to kind of know like this idea uh, and obviously have some understanding of what's going on here and that the free energy of a solution is lower than a pure solvent. But, um, you know, I'm not going to ask you to, like, explain to me how life originated on our planet uh, and draw diagrams of, like, potentials across cell membranes or something. I don't know what kind of crazy question you'd come up with. But. All right, so on to some of these equations. So I, I always kind of gloss over the math in this class, and I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I don't think math is important. I do. I really like math. I, when I was in college uh, 2,000 years ago, um, <clears throat> I mean, Jesus went to college together. Uh, I, I loved math. I was actually a dual major in math and probably would have got a second degree. Um, but I actually was in New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina, which is kind of was kind of like kind of like the pandemic for you, where it kind of just screws up your plans. So I ended up just getting a degree in chemistry, and I think I minored in math. Um, I mean, did I minor in physics? No, I did. I almost got a minor in physics as well. Anyway, the point is, I love math, um, and I think it's super important. But um, there's a difference between doing math and just doing like brute force calculations, and we do a lot of the kind of the latter brute force calculations uh, in this class. Uh, and when we <laughs> when we do a lot of that stuff, I tend to just kind of gloss over it because I know you guys are smart, and I know you're good at kind of just. One thing I know we do a good job of doing is is training you up on how to to solve these types of math problems. So I just want to make sure that you're not getting the wrong impression from me. I think math is super, super important. All the cool stuff we have, you have to use math for. Although I am an organic chemist, I don't use a whole lot of math myself, unfortunately. I try to. But, um, all right, so... If you're trying to quantify these things, so remember we have these different types of things. We have when you dissolve a solute into a pure solvent. We see a bunch of different things happen. One, we see that the vapor pressure is lower, which we know also means... We see boiling point elevation, because boiling point and vapor pressure are related. We see freezing point depression. Um, let's see, how would we describe this last one? We would say... Yeah, I guess we'd say like, I don't know, I'm just going to call it osmotic pressure. We can also measure like an osmotic pressure. So if we set up an experiment like the, 
Osmotic pressure is weird, right? Like it's sort of the oddball one here because these are all related to phase changes. And this is just kind of like, okay, well, what if I take a tube and I put some water in it across a semi-permeable membrane? Um, they're all colligative properties. That's what they share in common. They depend on the concentration. Um, but osmotic pressure is sort of the odd one out. Um, but we can measure the osmotic pressure too. So we can do all these different types of things and we have equations that uh, are associated with each of them. So let's start with just vapor pressure lowering. Oops. I'll just rewrite it. So for vapor pressure, <clears throat> if you have a, if you want to know the vapor pressure, which we're going to represent with this using the same notation as I think most textbooks use. We would say P solution is going to be equal to X times P with a superscript zero. Um, and so, and I'll put a little notation on this too. We'll call that X solid. So, so so delta. So we actually, how do we want to express this? Actually, probably the more. Yeah, let's say. Let me call it this. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's see, delta P. If I, I would do better a job of editing this, but my son is napping right now, so I'm worried that he's going to wake up before I get done with this video. So, um, so just bear with my mistakes <clears throat> and pretend like it's a real lecture where I make this in class and then have to correct myself. All right, not really a mistake as much as just a, a minor correction. We don't want to go through a derivation there. Okay, so vapor pressure lowering. If I want to know the change in the vapor pressure, like, so like say, so the experiment is I've got some pure solvent. I use water a lot, but it could be any solvent. And I dissolve some stuff in it, like sodium chloride. And I actually want to know, like, not just qualitatively, hey, I know that the vapor pressure is going to go down, but quantitatively what that is, I could use this equation. Uh, and it just states that the change in vapor pressure, <laughs> my son just woke up. Uh, the change in vapor pressure. Hey, buddy, how are you? Okay, it just states that the change in pressure pressure is equal to the mole fraction of the solute, which is this. Hey, buddy, the mole fraction of the solute. Yeah, you're gonna come help. Times the vapor pressure of the original solvent. So that little zero at the top just means that's your normal vapor pressure, and the amount of solute that I put in there. Um, the amount of solute that I put in there depresses the uh, or lowers the vapor pressure uh, by some amount proportional. So you see that it's nice and linear, right? Delta P is here. It's just some factor times some other factor. So this is a nice line that uh, we can work with. There's no, it's not like the clausius clapeyron equation. All right, buddy. Okay, let Papa finish up what he's doing. Okay, and then I'm, we're gonna come play. Okay. All right. Uh, so I will be back home without my toddler and finish this up. There are two other equations. There's the boiling point elevation equation um, and the freezing point depression equation. Boiling, actually I might be able to do it. Okay, so the boiling point elevation, oops, boiling point elevation, which is basically measuring the same thing So now let's say I'm doing the same experiment, but I want to know what happens to the change in temperature. So my actual change in boiling point, I want to take that, I multiply it times the Van Hoff factor, which we went over in a different video, times KB times the molality. Okay, so um, I is the Van Hoff factor. So remember that's this number associated with like the practical number of particles that end up in solution. Um, Here, how about play with this, buddy? Here. Look at this. I made this for you. 
Uh, that's the Van Hark factor. <laughs> KB is a constant associated with a particular um, uh, solvent. So, uh, yeah, there's like a KB for water, for example, which is like 0.5 degrees Celsius uh, per molal. Uh, and then M is, remember, that's the molality. So this is a constant associated with a solvent. This is a constant associated with a solvent. Here, check these out. And then this is the molality, which is the grams of solute per kilogram of solvent. And then lastly, we have freezing point depression. And the equation looks extremely similar to um, the boiling point elevation one. So again, it's delta T and it's equal to I times KF times M. I is again the Van Hoff factor. So this is the Van Hoff factor. K sub F is a constant that's associated with the solvent, but now it's the constant associated with the solvent for freezing. Um, and then M again is the molality. And then lastly, our equation for osmosis, if you're trying to calculate the osmotic pressure. We use this big Greek letter, pi, and we say that's equal to I, which is the Van Hoff factor again. Here we're using capital M, so I'm going to stress that that's molarity, not molality. So this is the one where you use molarity, not molality. And we multiply that times R and times T. And so R is the ideal gas constant, and T is obviously temperature. Anyway. Uh, that sums up. Here, come see, buddy. You want to sit on my lap? Say this. Can you say that sums up colligative properties? And we'll be moving on to more thermodynamics and equilibria in our next lecture. Thank you, guys, and thank you, Dorian, for making a guest the appearance. Um, we'll solve some problems in this during class. Uh, these are not. These are not too bad. All right. Thanks, guys.